Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our morning study. Uh, this is Thursday, December 22. Yesterday was uh, the 10 year anniversary from when Heidi and I had met. And um, so I failed to mention that. So that was the 10 year anniversary of the failed prediction of uh, the Mayan calendar, supposedly. But anyway, we're going to begin our study here with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, for the time that we have each morning to study together. We invite your spirit's presence here as we open your word, as we look into things that are meant to provide a conviction and a power in our lives. And... Uh, we are thankful, Lord, for each person who continues to study these things. We pray that they all can receive a blessing from you. Give us understanding as we try to continue to sort through the story of Samson. And um, we pray, Lord, for this week ahead. We ask that you can, can help and guide in our decisions and what we are to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so um just before we go into chapter 14 uh, i mean i know at the end we had asked some questions but people might have had a bit of time to think about uh, our study of judges 13 and so I'm just going to bring up our diagram that we had done. Is there anybody who has questions about this diagram? Corrections, things like that. <coughs> okay, so we're placing this at the midpoint at July 18th, as we had discussed. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the relevance at this point for the 494 weeks from November 9th of 2019 to the 3,207 days without weeks, both of these ending at, at April 29th of 2029? Okay. <clears throat> So, so we have what we did. So, just to explain it for somebody watching to understand the question. So, we we had taken the 494 prophetic months, which is 14,820 days, and that brought us. That was the last one I found. That brought us to Pentecost in 2030, uh, which is going to follow. Um, you know, that's because we have the fifth day of the fourth month, that is April 5th, 2030, as this date that we got from the week of Christ and several other very powerful witnesses of it. Um, so we had the 40 years in Judges 30. And so what we did is we took the 494 months, <clears throat> which is 2,084 weeks, by the way, um, in which the manna fell. And, and I haven't done anything with the, the 2,084 weeks as far as trying to convert that into anything else. I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, and then, but we had first taken the 494 um, months, uh, which is actually almost 40 years. So we just took that time that the manna fell, and that gave us the Day of Atonement in 2029. Now, that's going to be from November 9th, 1989. So all of those are from November 9th, 1989. And then what we did is we took 494 weeks and we did that from November 9th, um, 2000 or, or 2019, right? So November 9th, 2019, and that's 3,458 days. And that gave us this other prophetic marker, uh, Passover in uh, 29, 2029, so April 29th, 2029. And what um, 
the RAND notice is that it was 3,207 days from July 18th. I think it was a RAND. Should have been Stephen, but somebody did did that number. And, and we know that's a symbol of March 27th, a message for the Levites. And that brings us to this, this April 29th date. So I, I don't know what it means as far as you know, time, but as far as symbols, these symbols are produced. And we know that we have this extension of time, this application for additional extension of time, uh, that this movement has been given. So we know that God has given us more time to accomplish our work. And so that this November 9th date <clears throat> ties to uh, these dates in the future, we would have to say is significant. Now, there's probably still more analysis that we could do of this, but I, I haven't had the time to do it. I've been working on other things. Uh, I have some ideas of things that I would work up. But the question is, what is the significance of this date, Passover in 2029? What, because what is it trying to tell us? I mean, we have the symbol of the message to the Levites. And my view, whether this is literally talking about time or not, it's telling us that we have a message still to give to the Levites. And the significance of Passover um, is a, uh, because the way that we've understood Passover, it has to do with the disciples. That's part of how we look at it. Because if we go to Millerite history, these, these two Passovers, the true Passover and the false Passover. And the ones who rejected the first angel's message don't accept the true Passover. Um so they don't accept October 22, 1844. So they would have uh, a Day of Atonement that would be September 23, 1844, if they're going to follow the first Passover. But if you follow the second Passover, it gives you the October 22 date. And so when, when we look at these, this to me, these are symbolizing those that accept July 18th are also accepting the true Passover. And they have a Day of Atonement, and they have a Pentecost that are coming, whenever that is. I have a question. Yeah. What is the uh, name not known and the name known? Okay, so an important part of this structure. So we, we took Judges 13 as a chiasm. Um, it's, it's a type of literary chiasm. It's not a, a perfect chiasm that is, you know, match verse for verse sort of thing, but it is a general chiasm. That is the main aspect of the chiasm that we noticed is that we, um, that is Manoah and his wife do not know the angel's name. And after Judges 13, 13, which is the center of the chiasm of these verses, um, the name is going to be revealed to them progressively. So the character oh, okay. of the I got, I got is I don't remember now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other th important aspect is Angela noticed that not only was it not that the name was not known, um, she, she, she did not, not know where he came from. She says, I did not ask where he was from, and he did not give me his name. Right. So where he's from, um, we take as a loose association with Melchizedek. So that is, we tie Melchizedek <coughs> as a symbol with the Palmoni symbol. That his name is secret. And we, we look at that as, as the gospel in what we would call righteousness by faith. Con uh, connected to prophecy. Palmoni, the chronology, that these are tied together in Judges 13. And so what's being revealed to this movement is a revelation since July 18th of the understanding of the symbolic use of numbers in a much more solid way. Now, you know, we, we've been using symbolic, the symbolic use of numbers in this movement for a long time. 
but we, we could see that there was definitely ex an expansion of the understanding of that starting on November 9th. So we actually take the July 18th date as just the center, not literally, but the center symbolically of the 777 days. It's the center of the three Sabbaths that are marked there, November 9th, 2019, um, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021. So it becomes this symbolic center. And so July 18th rep represents actually all of that period of time, that 777 days. So there's this light uh, that comes in regard to Palmoni. And, and we can testify of that, right? We, we have this, the movement really starts to understand uh, in connection with November 9th and July 18th, um, how, how we are going to take these dates and symbols. Now, these had been worked on for a long time by me, Stephen, and Odilio. Um, and uh, so we, we get an expansion of this understanding of Palmoni in that period. But generally speaking, most people in the movement have not really appreciated the use of numbers. That is, they haven't used them correctly. Um, that is, the numbers don't exist by themselves. They are parts of structures. And so if you find a coincidence of numbers or something and you just figure that you can attach you know, 777 days to some date and then to some other date of some ex significant event, unless it's part of a, an overall structure, it, it's just a coincidence. And, and some people have a hard time with that. They say, well, you know, I can match this to this by these many days. And, and I've seen a lot of that, you know, through the last few years of people sending me things where they think they have found something. But when we and and when we get at these structures, um, they also give us light, and that light always agrees with past light. So there are ways that we can understand how to use these analytical tools. They're not meant to produce in and of themselves, apart from prophecy. They're not meant to produce, you know, new dates. We're, we're measuring the time that God's given us but we're not trying to predict events. We're just measuring dates and structures, but they're always a part of a structure. So you can see here, this, this is a structure. It has all kinds of witnesses within it. And so these are things that are designed by God. But if I just take some date, you know, there's something that happened in the news and I count 187 days later and something else happened, in the news and I want to connect them, unless they're part of our structure, unless they have multiple witnesses, those are just coincidences because you can take almost any event and connect it with some other event in some ways because events always have these, you know, they have time attached to them. And so you're gonna find coincidences of numbers. But when you have a complex structure, that's not the same thing at all. And so before I, you know, we ever did any of this, before I was even in this movement, I mean, I had been really familiar with a lot of Protestants' understandings of prophecies. And then when I started studying the 2520, I found more of them, where they would take dates from biblical history and match it with dates in uh, modern Jewish history and make claims about how this was some fulfillment of some prophecy. But there's so many events on so many different dates, and sometimes they're just taking years even, that you can almost create any kind of structure in that way. And so somebody looking at what we're doing superficially might think that we're doing that, but they don't understand how these structures have unfolded and how they have been witnessed by external events. So external events will witness to our structure, not to every date, but to important ones. And, and then the overall structure is just really an analysis of what we already understand. So I know that's a long explanation. So, so what we have now is this name is known or being made known in this time. So 
So any other questions regarding this? How did you get the 273 days and the nine months at the top? Oh, okay, all I'm saying it here is that's that's the time of gestation. So gestation is 273 days. And we're, we're taking chapter 13 as being um, the period of time when Manoah is told about this son that's going to be born. And so we're taking that this represents a period of nine months to Samson's birth. So it's it's um, we're not marking it as a time. We're just marking it as a symbol. I probably could have put it somewhere else. But I'm just saying that this whole period of time in Chapter 13 is covered, is, is starting a period of nine months. And it ends then with, a, with the birth of Samson. So that's going to be the end of that nine months. So that 40 years is tied together to these nine months. And I haven't really spent much time trying to figure figure that out, what that means. Um, it's just what I have put there. So uh, there's still a lot more analysis of this chapter, of these structures that uh, we need to do. But uh, we'll see when I have a chance to do it. I'm going to wait till after I'm finished this other paper that I'm working on. But that's a good question. Okay, anything else? 494 prophetic months. Yeah, so those are months of 30 days. Um, I mean, when the manna fell, it's 494 months that it fell. But those 494 months are actual lunar months of 29 and a half plus a little bit days, right? So it's 29 and a half days um, for each of those months. But if I take prophetic months, that just gives me um, a period that's longer by um, 222 days or 232 no, days. So it's 232 days longer. And so that's going to bring me instead to the, day of, to the Day of Atonement from November 9th, 1989. It's going to bring me to Pentecost. So I thought since it landed on Pentecost, it seemed significant that these three different ways that we can count this is, is going to produce uh, these different results. Okay, so good questions. So, I mean, we'll we'll come back to this when we're we're going through uh, chapters 14, 14 and fifteen, um, because we're going to have to relate the story of Samson and how it relates to the preamble to his birth. <clears throat> So in Judges chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnath and saw the women of Timnath and of the daughter of the Philistines. So here we, we previously just heard that he's born. And now he's uh, a teenager here. And he's um, finds the daughter of the Philistines and... Um, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Right. So what is Samson doing here? Prophetically. So this, if Samson represents uh, this movement in some way, a message in relationship to this movement, um, what is his role of wanting to get this daughter of the Philistines as a wife. He's looking to enter into covenant. Okay. So, so in, in understanding who Samson is, we, we know that he has to do with this message. Now, that's how we're making this application. 
but we can see that he's he's a type of Christ, um, but he's representing Christ in this ironic sense, which we then apply to the human nature of Christ. And as it is applied in humans, that is, this isn't Christ per se. It's it's a type of Christ. It shows what Christ is overcoming, these, these hum, these, this nature of Samson. Now, he's a Nazarite, we know. So he has this vow. And, and yet he's going to seek a wife of the Philistines. So this covenant, we know that, that God's people make a covenant with death, right? And, and Samson is as well. Right? In this context, he's making a covenant with death. We would agree with that. How else could you see it? Well, I can't see it any anyway else. Um, and then we have in the chat just this John 10, 16. What's John 10, 16? Well, it expresses Christ's yearning for sheep that are outside the fold. So if you're looking at this in an ironic way, this is Samson. You know, he's it's Christ looking for somebody who isn't a Jew to 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 marry or to win to to himself. Okay, right. So so when we so when we look at this ironically, so we, we know that it's it's showing a reverse. So on on the surface of the story, this is a covenant with death. But Christ seeks out the lost sheep. I mean, he's going to, to be uh, the desire of nations, right, of the Gentiles. And, and so uh, this is pointing to Christ's desire to have a wife outside of the Jews, right? So sometimes it's hard in our mind to sort of flip between these two. But if we see it as representing Christ, it has to be a good thing. But in the context of this movement, it represents a, a bad thing, right? So this movement is, is the thing that Christ is going to redeem, right? He's redeeming us. And so we have this desire to make a covenant with um, the Philistines. So this is a false system of study, right? It's a covenant with death in that context. Does that, does that make sense to people when, when we <laughs> look at it this way? When you're looking at, at a situation like this, to understand that the message is seeking to receive its light or enter into its covenant where it should not. Mm -hmm. It adds to the idea that this is a covenant with death. Right. We talk about the church making a covenant with death but we don't recognize that we have done the same thing. That this movement has, right? So we're not talking here about individuals. We're talking about this message and, and the direction that it's gone. When it's talking about Christ, when we apply it to Christ, it's a positive thing. But when we apply it to this movement, it's showing us our faults. Now his father and his mother say unto him, um, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren and among all the, my people that thou goest to take a wife of, that thou goest to take a wife of the, uncir of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So in this context, we can see that this is based upon uh, Samson's desire, not upon the God's word.
Now, the next verse, but his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now, when it says it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, who is the he referring to? God. Okay, so it, it's kind of hard to know. Um but definitely the Lord is behind this, right? So whether it's the Lord who sought an occasion against the Philistines or the he is referring to Samson. Now, um, this word occasion, um, so we don't really use this word uh, very often. Um, Ta'ana, and it's also used in Jeremiah. Both times it's translated as occasion. Um, I, I think it, it would, in the case of this word, um, this is talking about sexual desire. So this would be about Samson, his sexual desire. So it was of the Lord that Samson sought this an occasion against the Philistines. So God... God oversees this situation. So Samson is just um, involved in his own sexual desire, but this is of the Lord. How do we reconcile that? Like just in the in the straightforward sense. How does God work in this type of situation? Okay, if we were to, to do a, a scriptural comparison. Yeah. Wasn't God behind the situation with Judah and Tamar? Didn't he use that to work out his word? Okay. So, so this, this always raises this problem when God uses things that, that are sinful to his glory, right? But, but we have to remember that what God is doing is redeeming, right? It, it's, he is working out his will with sinful people so that his name can be glorified. Tendencies. Yeah. yeah. So man is never glorified in God's work. Man often seeks his own glory, but God never seeks the glory of man because man has no glory, right? Apart from God, we have no glory. Our glory is in Christ. I mean, this is what we're learning in reading A.T. Jones, 1893 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. So, so God takes a circumstance and uses it to his purposes. And, and we have, may have experienced this in our own lives, where God has taken some choice that we've made that, that was not of God, and turned it around to be of God. That is, we were we were um, instructed or disciplined by the results of, of the decision that we made. That if we hadn't made that decision, we wouldn't be where we are today spiritually. So, so God was in this, but also God is going to use this to overthrow the dominion of the Philistines that they have over Israel. And so he's going to use this sexual desire of Samson. But it's going to be to God's glory.
Okay. Now, should we make anything of this verse that it's 14 verse 4? You mean as of the 144,000? Yeah. Are we going to take this verse? I mean, we've been using many verses in, in this regard. Well, again, here we are addressing this in the ironic sense. Mm-hmm. So his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. Mm -hmm. So the proper union, the committed covenant does not understand that God is seeking this occasion against the Philistines. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how would we portray this in the ironic sense? Well, I mean, obviously we, we have to take this in a much different sense. I mean, it's not definitely not sexual desire, but we can see that, the idea of the 144,000 is tied up with this. Um, if we go to Revelation 14, I looked in low on Mount Zion, uh, looked and a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with them in 140 and 4,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000, which were redeemed from the earth. And these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. So if we take this verse, 14, verse 4, and we compare this to Judges 14, 4. Um, oops, let's go back here. Um, what we can see is that this is really the opposite. Right? Can we agree with that? Repeat your question, please. Judges 14.4 and Revelation 14.4 are the opposite. They're representing an opposite picture. All right. The 144,000 compared to uh, Samson, who has this desire for this woman, of the Philistines. The Philistines have dominion over Israel. In 14.4, in Revelation, it's, it's in a picture of the 144,000 um, who are redeemed from among men, and they're the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Right? And if you go just a little deeper than that in Revelation 14.4, Okay. Well, I mean, the, the situation is that you're giving the comparison that Samson, in looking to enter into this covenant relationship with those outside of Judaism, mm -hmm. is different from the 144,000 that are entering into their covenant relationship with God. Right. Now, these are redeemed from among men, even though they're they're given as each of these uh, 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. We know that they're not actually literally Jews, that they're spiritually Jews. And they were redeemed from among men. 
of all the people living on this earth, right? I'm not disagreeing. I'm just trying to think it through. And and these this these women, these are virgins, these are um these are connected with Christ's marriage to his church, this covenant marriage, right? Okay, but in the in the symbolic sense, these women that are virgins, they are churches that have not accepted the teaching of Rome. Would that also be correct? Well, well, they would be people who have not uh, accepted. I mean, I don't know if the 144,000 are 144,000 churches. So these are people that have a pure faith. So they haven't accepted the teachings of Rome. Yes. Right. So as Father Miller had said, symbols can have more than one symbolic meaning. Yeah. So we know they're not defiled with women, right? Samson is defiled with a woman, is he not? That's the way we're taking it. Yeah. So, I mean, I know it's 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 sort of, here it's talking about the 144,000. You know, they're men, of course, in this context, uh, symbolically, they're, they're, they're men, but they're not representing men. They're just representing people. And they're not defiled with these churches. But Samson wants to defile himself with the church. He wants to go into a covenant relationship with the Philistine woman, right? But these, these, the 144,000 are chaste. So Samson shows this um, opposite characteristic to the 144,000. Now we know the 144,000 are first fruits. I've been doing a study on the first fruits. Um, so the first fruits, remember when they cross. Uh, into Judah, or not into Judah, in, into uh, the land of Israel, into whatever we would call that there, the, the promised land. They crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Um, six days later, they're going to have this wave sheaf offering, and, and that's going to cause the cessation of the, 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 the manna that had been falling for 40 years. Right. So the, the first fruits is connected to the manna. Right. The, the, because the first time they have the feast of first fruits. Is going to be the day that the manna ceases. It's going to be the 16th day of the first month. Now, we, we've already used that manna right in this symbol on chapter 13 when the manna ceases. So it's tied to this feast of first fruits in some way symbolically, whatever that particularly means. But it would it is a symbol here of the 144,000. It's also a symbol of Christ, because he is the first fruits as well. So we, we can see that we can tie this uh, Revelation 14.4 to Judges 14.4. And, and and it's kind of, it's very significant on how these are tied together in this ironic sense. Now, since we use that symbol of first fruits in that time element in chapter 13, um, you know, we, we can see that it somehow connects with our time. Um, just by connecting Revelation 14.4 with Judges 14.4. Is there, um, you know, if we're going to deal with Samson's marriage, where do we place it? So, or this request for marriage. So we're not to the marriage yet, but this is, is leading up to it. Um, but where do we where do we place Samson's marriage in in our application of Samson to the history of this movement? So maybe a marriage to uh, 
far minder tests ideas maybe okay so so i mean we addressed it, this before we already studied this out but we hadn't put it on yeah. a lot and um so there's lots of things we said about Samson. But if we're going to take this story, we're going to put it on the line. We generally have been starting at 9-11, sometimes 11-9, right? Because they're connected together as a symbol. So, so that's something we're going to have to think about. Does this 14-4 verse um, give us some indication of where we're going to place this story of Samson again. Now, remember, um, in chapter 13, uh, you know, we said, even though this is leading up to Samson's birth, that this story of chapter 14 and 15, that they're going to repeat and enlarge what we saw in chapter 13. So, so they're all really kind of starting in the same place and ending in the same place, so to speak. That is, they're all about our history. And so what we need to look for is the symbols that are here that can tie this to our history, whether it's the number of the verses, whether it's um, words or, or spans of time, names, um, that can tie this into the history to see how it fits into the overall structure. So, so we got to keep that in the back of our, our minds, Judges 14, verse 4. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roareth against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father and mother what he had done. So Samson has the spirit of the Lord come upon him. And he's going to have this lion that has come against him. So the spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon him. And he's going to tear this lion with his bare hands, right? Is this similar to Numbers 24? Okay. So in Numbers 24, you're referring to um, the story of the disobedient prophet with the line? Wait, is that what you're talking about? There? It's just... the Balaam and Bala, but it's, it's got the line in it too. Okay, okay. Because I knew that was over in this story. So um okay yeah so you're going to have the line um yes 24 where it says uh where where's the exact verse i know we're gonna uh, have nine yeah um he couched he laid down as a line as a great line who shall stir him up blessed is he that blesseth thee and curseth he that curseth thee so he's going to mention this lion symbolism in this story. Okay. Um, and this is going to be connected with this, these cursings of Balaam. Uh, he's also going to talk about Jacob. So the line, of course, uh, uh, is this symbol of God's people. So, uh, but I was also thinking of uh, the story of the disobedient prophet too, with a line that's um, in that story. So I don't know if we could connect those, how we would connect those. So again, another thing to keep um, in the back of our minds as we're looking at Judges 14. So what else about this line that roars? I mean, we know that Satan goeth about as a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
But is it Satan that is roaring in this verse or Christ? Okay, well, how about both? Depends which story you're looking at. I was thinking more in Revelation than I was anywhere else. Okay, so you're going to take it in in the reverse of what's talking about here. I mean, I mean, Satan uh, is seeking to devour because of his hatred toward Christ. But when Christ roars. Isn't this an answer to shut down what Satan is looking to do? Yes. So here, in this case, if we're taking this story, I would take this as, um, well, because we have a lion roaring against Samson. So Samson's a type of Christ. So this, this would have to be, if we take it in the type, the type is Satan roaring against Christ. But here, since we take this in the ironic sense, this young lion that roareth, because in, in what we see on the surf surface, is a young lion is representing God's people. Right? So this would be a positive, in this ironic story, a positive thing, if that makes sense. Because if we look up this, um, the Hebrew here, if we start comparing uh, verses that address this young lion, um, so we have here young, which means um, uh, kefir. So this is really a village, and it is covered with a maid, right? So that's what it means there. So it can be translated as lion young lion or village village and then it's going to have of course the word line itself right so it, it has really two words for lion so just the word itself can be lion but here it's attached to the word lion you know this word re so so we have this line here. And if we look at other places where this word occurs, so, I mean, I know we have it in Hoshea, Hosea. Um, uh, this is Hosea chapter 11, verse 10. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. And when he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Um, we have, let me see some other verses. I was thinking of, maybe it's the other word. I'll do it this way in the Strong's. <clears throat> So if we look up young lion, we're going to be given um, Isaiah 31 and, and 30. Um, so let's look at so I 30, Isaiah 30 verse 6 says, Burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion. Right, where he talks about that. And then in 31, verse 4, for thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for the Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. Now, 
So one thing we can see is that this, um, we can also have, uh, let me see, there's these. Um, Ezekiel 19 talks about, uh, moreover, thou take up lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, what is thy mother? A lioness. She lay down among the lions. She nourisheth, nourished her whelps among young lions, and she brought up one of her whelps. It became a young lion. It learned to catch the prey. It devoured men. So you can see that we have lion, young lion, representing sometimes God, and sometimes it's the enemy. Right. Um, so it's going to be used in all different types of... So the lion can be used to represent Christ. It can be used to represent Satan. So it, it's one of those symbols that has more than one meaning. Hosea 5, this is the one I was thinking. Um, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to the king of Jerob, yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I even I will tear and go away. I will take away, and none shall rescue him. So here we can see that God is, in this sense, a lion and a young lion. But this lion is holding honey. Um, you're talking about in the story of the dis of 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 uh, Samson there, right? So that there's going to be honey inside this lion that he's going to kill, right? That's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, there is something that, um, and I think the the way that I take the parable is that we have something that's dangerous, yet something that, that's going to come of it that's sweetness, right? So something, in a sense, evil, because here we have Samson. He's the chosen of God. We have a lion roaring against him. Um, so this would be... Who's roaring against Samson that he's going to come with the spirit of the Lord and tear this lion? So this and would have to be. And he also does this behind his, behind his father and mother's back. Yeah. Now, so in, the, in the, 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 the story in its face, this lion is the enemy, right? And, and Samson, of course, is... Um, you know, he's the deliverer, but we know that he's got these negative aspects to him. So this line that roars against him is the enemy, right? But when we take this story and we turn it around, uh, we would have to say that, that this is God correcting us. He's giving us something because you know, Samson, he's not going to be killing God. So the line can't represent God in this sense. At least I don't think it can. On, on this, the story on the surface, it has to be this enemy. But we can see that it is God's correction of this movement. God, if, if a I line see, goes, I, see, I see them both as good. Just misunderstanding. Okay. Okay. So you're saying that this lion, I mean, he represents something. I'm just saying on the surface of the story, a lion coming against you is a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's, it's the enemy roaring. Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so here, 
in this story, just as a story, not as a symbol, the line is not a positive element. And, and he's going to have the spirit of the Lord come upon him to fight against this line. So the spirit of the Lord is God is going to come and give him this strength because of his Nazarite vow to defeat this lion. So in the surface story, the lion's a negative thing. But when we take this story and turn it around, and, and I think this is actually part of what helps turn it around, is when he returns, right? So he's going to kill this thing. He went down, talked with the woman, and she pleased Sam, Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. So we have Bumblebee Lane, right? Bumblebee Road, whatever it is. North Bumblebee Road. So we can see that the bees represent uh, this message. And then we have the honey in the carcass of the lion. So, so on the surface here, we see something bad. It's defeated by Samson. But now it provides something sweet. And, and he's going to also eat this honey. But he doesn't tell anybody about it. Even though he gives them. And they also eat. Okay, so I know this is tough. <laughs> but can we see that what we are doing right now is eating honey out of the carcass of a lion? I think we should be able to see it. Okay. So... And this, this honey out of the carcass of a lion, I mean, this honey comes from North Bumblebee Road, right? Is that where it comes from? Does it come from the bees? Would FSA be the B? Be the B? <clears throat> yeah. Mm. But it's in the carcass of a lion. So something was killed. This lion was killed by Samson, by this message. But this message is going to be fed with this honey from the carcass of the lion that was slain by this message. So what does that mean as a symbol? Does well, the remnants message, of the, the, oh, does the message slay another message? Okay. I, I would say that that's correct. And that word bees is Deborah, right? Okay. Okay, so the honey is Hebrew 1706, and the address of uh, the School of the Prophets is 761. Is that correct? Okay. <clears throat> I always thought it was 759, but um. so we do have 759 North Bumblebee Road. So where do we get the 761 from?
Iran, where do, where do you get the 761? I mean, I know that address is there too, right? But uh, exactly. The Lambert, Lambert Church? No, no. Lambert no. Church doesn't have an address there. I think it's just the next address, but there's 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 more than one lot there. But on the sale of it, it was 759 North Bumblebee Road. So anyway, it's just uh I'll figure that out. <clears throat> um but definitely we have the bees representing bumblebee and the honey, which is the message. It's in the carcass of, of the lion that Samson kills. So he's going to take this in his hands and he eats this and he comes to his father and mother. He gives them of this honey as well. They eat it. Doesn't tell them about this, where it came from. Okay, so what else can we get from this whole symbol of the lion and the honey? So would Samson actually be using the other message behind the back? The other message behind the back. Well, I, I would think it's more just that it's something that's hidden that's going to be revealed. Right? Because we already have this idea of something that's hidden, that's secret, and that's going to be revealed later. And it, it comes in the form of a riddle, right? So, so I, I'm taking that this pattern, uh, this story here of the honey from the lion becomes a major part of this story, does it not? And we've already taken that this message is this eating of the little book, which is sweet in the mouth like honey, but it makes the belly bitter. So we've already understood that symbol. Okay, so we're kind of, I mean, we've gone through this in detail before. So now we have these 30 companions. So what's the significance of the 30 companions? This is going to be at the feast. He makes this feast. Or so young men used to do. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought him 30 companions to be with him. And then Samson's going to tell them a riddle. You can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out. Then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. So these are sheets are like shirts. And then he's going to have changes of garments that's probably over the, the ones that go over. So they're going to get some shirts and a suit. Are these 30 companions symbolizing 30 prophetic days? Okay. So, so we already have the 30 in other places. And we do say that it symbolizes the month. Right? The month of 30 days. Right? So we have that symbol. 
Um, but remember, we had the 30, 30, and 30. And so here you're going to have 30, 30, and 30. Or is that correct? 30 companions, 30 shirts, 30 changes of raiment. As a number, yeah. Right. Now, um, with the 30, 30, 30, um, let me see if I can find it. So if you take 30, 30, 30, the number 30, 30, 30, and you divide it by 12, you get 25.25. Two five. No, no, not two. You get, let me see, 25,252.5. That's what you get. So. Um, so Judges 10 4 has a triple 32. Yes, that's what we were talking about. The triple 30s. So we're just going to write it like this and divide it by 12. And you're going to get 25,252.5. And so that represents the 777. Okay, so the 761 in Bubble Bee Road is what comes up when you click the diamond building. So diamond is reference to, uh, that's the main meeting hall. If I remember correctly, the, the, the main school. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Around? I'm not yeah. sure. It's the, it's the big, the largest building there. Yeah, that's the, that's the school, right? So, you know, technically you have two houses, but uh, there is the, the school itself. And so it says 761 shows. Okay, so that's interesting. So we connect that with the word honey. And now we can connect um, this 30, 30, 30. Uh, yeah, it's like 300 as well as a symbol, uh, the 300. But we have it tripled here, 30, 30, 30. And when it's divided by 12, and why would we divide by 12? Twelve is the number of the covenant. It's the number of the tribes of Israel. And we get this number, which we can see represents the 252 and the 525 days of the 777 structure. So it's another symbol that ties us to, um, to our history, to, to this movement. And, and we've had it uh, two other times already. 30, 30, 30. So why it shows up, it, it just ties us, it ties it all together. So you can see that these stories are repeat and enlarge, that they're telling the same history. Now, of course, we have the seven days of the feast, and that would represent the 777 structure, correct? And the riddle, the answer to the riddle will be given at the end of the feast. So is the answer to the riddle given after December 21st, 2021? Or December 25th, 2021, pardon me. <clears throat> Because this study, is this study, did it not begin the day after December 25th, 2021? We're now on study number 250. I believe so. Okay, so this riddle then has to do with an understanding of the message that is represented by the honey. 
because we've had the honey, but we didn't really understand where the honey came from. Does that make sense? It shows a logical progression. Okay. So, so we've had a message, but we haven't understood it fully. We haven't understood its origins, the significance of it. And so, in a sense, we're like the father and the mother who eat this honey, but aren't told where it comes from. The, the seven day feast. <coughs> well, it wasn't just that Vashti had a seven day feast. This is actually the Akitu festival uh, that Xerxes or Ahasuerus had at the end of 180 days, which ties uh, the first day of the first month in the Babylonian calendar to this feast in, in the fall. So that's the fall Akitu festival. And that's the one in Belshazzar's feast. It's the same feast. It's the same celebration. Because uh, his is in the same same period of time there in the fall. And um, um, so this is the worshiping of all these gods, especially in the story of Belshazzar. They spent the whole year, uh, the first seven months of the year, transporting uh, the gods from throughout the realm bringing them to Babylon so that they could be worshipped. That's what Belshazzar was doing. So, so we see that in the story of Xerxes as well. doesn't explicitly talk about all the different gods and so forth, but there would be some connection there. And, th and that's why they're drinking from the golden cups that, from the sanctuary, um, because they're showing their power over these different gods. The power of their god over all these other gods <clears throat> but anyway um so we can see the seven days of the feast is connected to the story of xerxes in chapter one and it's also connected to this movement because so it's connected to july 18. so the thing that we could say about this story can we see that it parallels chapter 13. the july 18th is really the whole point of this. It works. Okay. <laughs> now, in 1414, he's going to tell the riddle, and he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not, in three days, expound the riddle. So remember, um, it says, like, the, he has the seven days of the feast. But it says in three days they could not expand the, expound the riddle. So what's happening here? Why is all of a sudden this three days mentioned? What's the three days? Doesn't, doesn't, don't we have that represent uh, December 25th? Oh, it could be, but could it also be that those three days are representing the three days that Christ was in the grave? Well, okay, we can connect them to the crucifixion of Christ as a symbol, yeah. But we also connected the three days to December 25th because of Ezra. So it's the 20th day of the ninth month. And there's this call to understand, like this call to repentance in Ezra. But here it's, it's to understand the riddle. And the three days can represent November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. So the fact that they can't, expound the riddle in three days would be significant in our understanding of that. And then we connect these three days. So even though we have these three days and we have the end of our period, 
um, of the seven, seven, seven days, which represents the week, right? Represents the week represents that seven, seven, seven days. We still have on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with, house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have, and is it not so? Um, so Samson's wife here, this is this Philistine woman. Um, and, and Samson seems... Uh, to basically uh, be susceptible to be manipulated by a church when there's emotion involved. Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father or nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. So, I mean, here it mentions the three days. But then it's going to sort of go back and say she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. Um, my idea is that the remaining of the seven days while the feast lasted is how I would read the story in the literal sense. But um, <clears throat> she's gonna, he's gonna finally tell her. And of course she's gonna tell. Um, um, to the children of her people and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found my riddle. Now, now we know that that's an idiomatic expression that has to do with committing adultery or you know, sexual intercourse with um, Samson's wife, right? So, um, so what's being depicted here and how would we place this, this story on our line, right? And remember, he, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He goes down to Ash, Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave changes of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom she had used as his friend. Um, so what is this story about in relationship to our movement? I mean, we see Samson's desire, all the things that he's doing. Morally speaking, this is not correct. Yet God here is taking this story and we're making an application of it to our movement. So what is this story about and how would we place it on a line? I mean, we, we can, I'm pretty much sure that we can agree that it relates to July 18 and to the 777 structure, just like chapter 13 does. So what else can we get from this? What are we what, what what other things have we missed? What about the sun going down? Are we speaking here about the evening and morning? Um, well, I don't know about the morning. Well, the evening precedes the morning. That's how we, we would denote a day. Yeah, I know. It just doesn't say anything about a morning. It just talks about the sun going down. And, it, and it's not going to use, um, uh, it's going to use the word charis, which uh, comes from an unused root, root meaning to scrape. 
referring to the sun, perhaps from the me meditating idea of the sun, a mediating, mediating idea of the sun. So normally we have Shemesh for sun. So it, it's the seventh day ending. Now, of course, this is the seventh day of the feast. It's not really mentioning whether it's the seventh day of the week, but we can use it as a symbol of that. So in our history, when is sunset? So remember in Millerite history, where is sunset? Wouldn't that be October 22nd, 1844? Okay, so where's midnight? So sunset precedes midnight. Well, in the Millerite history, we've always applied midnight as being July 21st. Right, and so it's midway between sunset and, and sunrise, right? So, so where's sunset in Middle Age history? Iran put it in the chat there. Nineteenth so, of April. Right, so yeah. April nineteenth is sunset, and we line up April nineteenth with nine eleven. Right, so nine eleven is sunset. But we also recognize that in different lines, we can mark a sunset. Because if we have a midnight in a line, we must have a sunset in a line. Now, we had um, the Passovers, the, the true Passover and the false Passover in, in Millerite history as being on either side of the first day of the first month. And, and we tied together these symbolisms of the Passover. Uh, we tied it into our history, con connecting with um, the S May 2nd representing 2014. Tabo took... Um, well, he didn't do it. There was blessings, but he took blessing studies, we'll say, and um, connected May 2nd with the second Passover. And then Chawatu came along and said, well, that May 2nd lies in 2014. And so it says that that sunset, and Chawatu was correct, except that he was looking at a different line. So in some ways, we can put 2014 as sunset. But 2014 is connected to Parminder because Parminder makes this prediction in 2012 about the Sunday law coming in 2014. <clears throat> and, and Parminder has some light there, some truth, but it's mixed with error. And, and I think, you know, I mean, my view is that Parminder was trying to follow the truth at that time. But when his prediction was treated the way that it was by Jeff, they saw it as an insult. And, and then from then on, he sought to take over FFA, which, which he eventually did.
Okay, so so we can plus play Sunset in 2014, but we could probably play some Sunset somewhere else. I mean, just because we can we can put it at 9/11 because that's the first day of the first month. Um, we could put it in different places. So, so I don't know where exactly we're going to put this sunset and where we're going to put this, uh, this solve this ex, ex, expanding of the riddle, expounding upon the riddle. They're going to give the solution to the riddle. Um, and then Samson's actions in salute, in killing these thirty men and taking their garments. Now we know that garments represent character as well. I mean, so in this story, there is a group of people that is going to understand this riddle, even though in the story it's done in this, all of this immorality exists. We have to strip away the immoral aspects of the story and apply them to this movement. So, I mean, we're going to do that um, more next week. We're going to go over this a bit more. <clears throat> But we're going to remember that in chapter 15, uh, we're going to have the story of Samson and Delilah, right? So we're going to have a similar story. And um, so we're going to be able to put that story into place with what we already have. So chapter 13, 14, and 15, I take as a repeat and enlarge. So we have chapter 13. It's going to be repeated by chapter 14, that history. And then chapter 15 is going to repeat the same history, just give different de details. Any further thoughts on this before we close with prayer? Just a lot of other symbols to consider. Okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time we've had here this morning. And I just pray that you can um, bless each person in their study, bless them today. Um, we know that you have given us um, light, and that light needs to be shared. We just ask for wisdom. On how this can be done. Help us to be faithful in the things you've given us to do and to be obedient to your word. Be with each person now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.